Tres. Hi, Gerardo. How's it going? How's everything in Atlanta? Hey, Daniel. All good. Thank you. All good. What about, what about where, where are you right now? You're always right traveling. Now, right now, and it's funny, I'm in Miami Tech Week. So I came here to Miami because there's a lot of entrepreneurs here that are moving. And apparently the mayor, Mayor Francis, who's like, he's, he's doing a lot of marketing on Twitter and, and convincing people to move from Silicon Valley to, and from New York to Miami. Red, he's red hosting it. events. And, and so I'm here and I'm trying to network as much as possible. And uh, are, are those face to face? They're face to face, yeah. So like today there was one at 9.30 a.m. and there was a lot of people there. The mayor was there and it's pretty cool to see someone like very few politicians who, who think this way, you know? So like, wow, pretty interesting. Wow, congrats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for all the li people that are listening, Gerardo and I got to know each other because we were in a project And, and Gold Media Tech, which is our company, was handling the engineering side and Gerardo was managing the, the marketing side. And I was very impressed with his work and with the advice that he was giving our, our client. And, and you know, I, I, just, I just felt that our viewers would benefit a lot learning from Gerardo and all of his experience. Gerardo, I'm gonna say a few things about you on, that, that are on your LinkedIn and feel free to add anything else uh, that you might want. So you went to, you're originally from, I think you're from, you met, this is not here, but you told me you were from Argentina, but you grew up in Mexico, right? That's right. Uh, that's right. And part of the Argentinians that emigrated to Mexico with their families in the 70s. I was a baby. Uh, yes. Yeah, cool. And, and I recently saw a movie up about the tragedy that you guys went through in those, in those. Yeah, in the, the military years, yeah. In those years, yeah. you went to the Tecnológico Monterrey, which is a very, very recognized school in, in Mexico. You actually studied systems engineering. So you're kind of like a, you're a former engineer. <laughs> I am. I am an engineer. I am an engineer. I my engineering thinking to marketing. But yes. And I, no, I, I, though, I, that's a, yeah. for, for those of, of, I'm from Latin America, and that's a very, very prestigious school in Mexico. So. So, so yeah. And then you have, you have an MBA from London Business School, right? That's right. And you went, was this, did you do it after graduation or you do it a few years later? No, I did, I did it a few years later. It was actually sponsored by my employer. So I, wow. I, after school, I worked for a company called United Distillers that then was bought and became a very large drinks company called the Agile. They... You know them by their brands. You know they 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 are the largest spirits uh, company in the world with brands like Smirnoff and Johnny Walker and Bailey's and Guinness and all sorts of different uh, products. I know the Adjus is one of the top. It's one of the top. Of, yeah, in the world. Yeah. Yeah. So so I was I was working for them in Mexico, and they uh, offered me a job in the headquarters in London. So I moved. London with them in 1997 and then I was uh, I was at the time interested in doing an MBA and they suggested uh, I, I, I did the, the executive MBA uh, at London Business School so instead of me having to stop working and go to, to business school I did it while I was working with the agile and they paid for it so you know it was it was a great deal for me and that's a very prestigious school like That's one of the top MBAs right now in the world. So that's a very good MBA. And how, like, okay, then from reading here, you went through the Agile, which is, I would say, a Fortune 500 company. Then you did yeah. some consulting. Then you ended up in one of my favorite companies, Disney. We'd love yeah. to hear more about that later on in, 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 the, sure. in the interview. And then you went to Turner. Is this the Ted Turner guy? Yeah. CNN? CNN, Cartoon Network, TNT, TBS, yeah. Wow, that's so. If you've had a quite a great experiences at a big corporations, and then you did you started your own company for a while, and and no, and then you started your own company after after all these years. That's right. So at some point, um, 
I left uh, Time Warner. So Turner was uh, the TV arm of Time Warner. So Time Warner had uh, HBO uh, as the premium channel, then Turner as the channels, and then they had Warner as the studios. And I left them when AT&T uh, purchased them. So AT&T purchased Time Warner and became part of AT&T. And at the time there was a lot of restructuring going on and I left. And at the time I decided instead of going back to the corporate world to set up my own, own business. And I, you know, I joined WSI, which is a global group of independent marketing agencies and I opened up my own practice here in Atlanta. That's awesome. Give me one second. Okay, so you joined, give me one second. So you decided to join after, you decided to start your own company after that and you never looked back, back since. How long have you, how long have you been with your own company? For after, three years. For, for three years, years. okay, okay, cool. Cool, cool. So, so, oh, so I took one year off, I took, I took one year to figure out what I wanted to do. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, within that time, I decided I wanted to open up my, my, my own company and then I, I launched three years. Cool, so, so for those of you listening, I, I mean, Turner, Disney, and the Azure, they, yeah, those are one of like the top companies in the world. Let me ask yeah. you, let me ask you, Gerardo, and now that you're, that's a very good question because a lot of our listeners are entrepreneurs and, and they want to be entrepreneurs. Was it hard to make that decision? Like from um, home, or yeah, like you had kids, or or you were you already a little bit retired, or like what was the situation in that sense? So the, so the situation was, I mean, it is hard uh, to make that decision because it's very uh, fundamental to you know, it's, yeah, it's going to have a lot of impact on on your immediate income. It's going to have a lot of impact on your immediate um, job situation, right? So. Mm -hmm. it, I guess with perspective, I could probably have done it earlier to have more time to do my business because I'm enjoying it so much. Um, but it was tough because um, it represented a lot of risks, right? Uh, when you work for so many years in big corporations, you know, you, you earn good money and you, you get used to the benefits, right? So stock options and the, the medical insurance and, you know, all of those different things that when you are on your own, you don't have, right? So, so it was tough, but the, for me, it was kind of like a no brainer because my, where I am right now in my life, eh, to move to a different city, I'm, I'm in Atlanta, right? Turner was mm -hmm. in Atlanta. Uh -huh. If I wanted to stay in the industry, in the media industry, I was actually- Do you, mean, in, hey, Gerardo, do you hear noise? Do you hear some noise? No? Do no? you hear okay. it? Give, give me one second. Yeah, no, no, I, I'm hearing that. some noise. I'm hearing some noise. Give me one. Let me see. Maybe I could use this. Give me one second. Give me one second. Uh, now, now I can now now I can hear you better. So, okay. so you so so you were mentioning that you were at a point in your life where you were more where you wanted so, something different. Yeah, I mean, I, I was at a point in my life where, so if I wanted to stay in me, I had to make a decision, right? So if I wanted to stay in media, which which I spent the last 15 years doing, I would have to move, right? Because most of the, the, the media companies were are based in New York or based in LA. Um, and the, I was actually getting interviewed for jobs in New York and LA. And the, I just didn't want to move. You know, I had I have three teenagers um, I just didn't want to uproot my family, go to a different place in an industry that was going through so much change that there was no job security, right? Because of the streaming wars, right? So you had, at the time you had like Prime pushing very hard and you have Netflix and Hulu and everybody launching different streaming services. So it's an industry that it's buying each other. It's, it's in, in, it's in con constant um, consolidation, right? and disruption. So I just felt that it was very risky for me to take another job in media and, and move and my family. You were in Atlanta. Yeah. And you had some job offers in New York. And let me ask you, you felt that you could, if you accepted maybe in a year or two, company gets acquired or something and again, moving again. So you, Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 
So that's why I decided to open up my own business and bet on, 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 on my abilities oh, and on, yeah, on myself, yeah. right? So that's, that's a decision I took. <laughs> and no, and it paid off. Yeah, it, pay, it, it paid off, but it's tough, man. I mean, you, you're an entrepreneur. You know about yeah. this. I mean, it's really, really tough. The first to... years are tough. The first years are tough. And yeah. how, many, how many years have you been doing this? I've been doing this for four years. And okay. the first year it was super tough uh, because I, I'm, 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 I'm quite young. And, and, and I think I had a year, a job experience for about a year. Mm-hmm. And then after that, my entire group of friends was doing investment banking, management consulting, or working at top firms. And there was me before entrepreneurship was this popular. Like mm-hmm. now being your entrepreneur, it, it's more popular than, than when you started than ever, than ever. Yeah. Like it's not. And I, I remember, I remember that a lot of people were telling me like, I even, I even, I even started thinking maybe I should. So the way I got into my company, I, I met this, I, I, I did an internship at a startup called Paribus and my, my, this company got acquired in a year. And the guy that they hired there was, was doing digital marketing for their digital marketing services. That guy was making, I saw how much they were paying him. And I was like, I was like, man, this, this is a very good opportunity. I'm not sure if I saw how much he was making, but the, the, the person, the head of growth, he advised me to start this. He's actually advised me to start a digital marketing agency because he felt like, mm-hmm. man, if you can get a couple of clients, it's just extremely profitable. And it's a very good business. Mm-hmm. But I felt that, that I didn't have that experience that I didn't. So I ended up, I'm not going to summarize it, but I ended up doing engineering services. I, I, I met, a, I, I knew a lot of, I, I have a, a minor in computer information systems mm-hmm. and, and I knew a lot of engineers in Latin America and I felt that was a better fit for us. But the first yeah. years were tough. We're tough because you, you, you get a client and you, you lose a client and, and it's all until you hit like bigger clients when you, when you start having options and then you start getting referrals. So, mm-hmm. it, so I, I understand where you're coming from. I think it, it's more, for me, the risk was that I had never had a job, like, yeah, uh, like a three or four year at a company. That was my yeah. risk. Yeah. So if this failed, it's just harder to get a job after being. You just have to basically start another company. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, but it didn't fail, so so it was yeah, a good yeah. bet. Yeah, you're doing well. <laughs> yeah, and and here we are. So Gerardo, my my first question is, how did you get into marketing? Like you started engineering. And then you did your MBA, but like, why marketing? And yes, that's a that's a very good question. So, so before talking about my experience, let me tell you a little bit about marketing, right? Okay. So, in marketing, you have like two two different sets of marketeers. You have the very highly creative people that uh, that uh, come into marketing, right? And then you have the marketeers that are highly organized and, and numbers oriented. Okay, and when I was coming into marketing, a lot of my friends from engineering, they were, you know, the, the engineering track after school was either you went into a into a, um, a engineering job, or you had companies like Unilever and Procter coming in to hire engineers for their marketing positions, because what they liked about the engineers was the process orientation, the fact that an engineer likes to put things in boxes and look at results and analyze and improve and optimize, right? So they would test you for some creative ability. So if you had some left brain abilities, <laughs> which is your creative brain, but you were an engineer, you were a good fit for those companies, right? Um, so I saw a lot of my friends moving into marketing, but I decided to go into an engineering, pure engineering track. So I went into a consulting company and we were doing a just-in-time consulting and system implementation. So I went straight into working you know, in, in, in plants and facilities and, and, and developing a, a industrial systems. Um, now, when I started my career, I did a minor in commerce, in international okay. commerce. So I was very interested in, 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 in the business side. And, and, and what happened was that after a year working as an engineer, 
doing what engineers do, I realized that I, I was not happy. I did not like it. <laughs> I hated it. I loved engineering when I was studying it, yeah. but I just didn't like the job. Okay. It you was not for me. I just, I just didn't feel at home. Um, so one of my friends that had moved into marketing said, Hey, why don't you try for a job in marketing? You know, there's, there's uh, somebody's hiring. A, it's an entry level position. So I was one year behind everybody else, but I, I, I went, I attended, a, I got the job and that's how I started in marketing. And I loved it. I immediately felt like this was what I wanted to do. And it was just, uh, you know, I just made a career out of that. So I never looked back. But all of the, my engineering background has really helped me in my career because I'm very process oriented, very data oriented. And I think now more than ever, especially with digital marketing, that's more valuable than ever. Right. So, so yeah, oh, but that, that's, that's how I got into marketing. No, no. Wow. That's a great story. That's a, I didn't know that. I, I didn't know that back in the day working at, at Unilever or Procter and Gamble was like the biggest. It was like the biggest. So yeah. I didn't work for Unilever Procter. I worked for Diageo, which was one of the other, the uh, consumer good companies, right? So, but it was the same thinking, you know, they were looking for somebody who could understand the creative side of marketing, but then really work on, because think about this brand managers, the traditional brand manager role at, at that time was not only the advertising piece, but it was the p l of the brand, right? The, the profit and loss, the, 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 the numbers, uh, the, the, you know, making sure that you were um, getting the right return investment on each of the marketing campaigns. And so all of those things are very number oriented, right? And process oriented. And they were looking for people that could ma handle both. And that, that's now that you mentioned that now we have digital marketing and, and you can really measure the mm -hmm. success of a campaign back. I don't know. In the, when you started, it be, was this the two thousands? 1999 the 90s yeah in the 90s like how how did you measure a return on investment in those times like it was harder right yeah it was harder but um you know um, it was possible so you could you could not measure it the same way that you can measure right now a campaign right i mean you and i know you put an ad you know if if that ad drove clicks to a landing page and how many people converted into a lead or how many people actually purchased uh, on that landing page, right? It's very, very uh, um, immediate and, and, and you can attribute that sale specifically to a, an action you took. When, when in the past, marketing couldn't, couldn't measure quite the same way, but we could still do a, a, a and B testing by location, by cities, and see if campaigns work better in one city than another. It was way more complicated to measure than okay. today, but you know, you could do that, and that's the way you, you know, you you would you would scale up campaigns, and 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 you know, some companies like Procter and, and Unilever fine tune that to perfection, right? So okay, yeah. it, it was possible, but it was it was harder. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah. Now. How did you, like, now you, we have, the, how did you get into digital, Mark? Like, you, you saw the whole transition. Yeah. And did you ever see companies, like, go under, like, competitors oh, yeah. because they didn't catch up to digital marketing trends? Or you saw small brands just grow. Disrupt. In yeah. Thanks to social media and thanks to this. I remember in 2015, I, I was doing an internship and, and, in, in this company and some friends like, what are you doing? So I'm working here in social media, like social media, that's not a, and the, the, he was like, that's not a thing. And now it's like the thing. Now it's social media. It's like everything. Yeah. So like, yeah. So yeah, I mean, I, I've seen, I've seen a lot of, a lot of that going on. And in fact, the industry that I was part of, which was entertainment was one of those companies that were really disrupted by technology. Right and by uh, services that use technology to promote differently and to create a different business model, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, uh, streaming uh, um, is a totally different experience than watching TV on you know, traditional TV. And, you know, all of those factors really uh, um, 
uh, are causing uh, that industry, the, the TV industry, to be to be uh, um, dying, really dying and struggling, right? And you saw the same with printing, and you saw the same, and and. Not only that, but then how you capture audiences, how you understand your audiences, how you engage with them, right? Um, how do you learn about them? Everything that is related to all of the data that you can collect, all the data analytics, right? You know, the whole, the, you know, the whole fact that now you can have uh, people interacting on an app allows you to collect so much information that now you can use that to provide them and serve them with better content, with better services that they need, you know, all, all of that thinking. It's, it's, not, it's not that the technology has changed, it's, it's mind shifting how you, how you run a business, you know? Mm -hmm. The way you think of a business when you have data is totally different to the way you think of a business when you don't have data. And I think it's, it's, almost, it's almost like a different language. So a lot of executives struggle, what I've seen in, in a lot of executives in traditional um, industries understand that they need to make this transition, but they struggle with the mind shift that you need to have, right? Uh, to I be think able it's to, a whole new world, you think? It's a whole new world. It's a whole new world. Mm -hmm. So to your question, how did I decide to do this? Well, when I was in, as, as a client, when I was in, 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 in corporate America, um, I saw this shift going on, right? And I actually saw, I had a budget, a marketing budget that I sp had to spend every year. And, you know, maybe years ago, I would spend 5% in digital. And then the next year, I would spend 10% in digital. And suddenly it was 30%, 50%. I could see that me as a client, I was spending more in digital because I could track the results, because I could be more confident of what, what we were doing, because I could actually gather better data. So when I decided to set up my own business, I decided to do it in digital because I saw how the budgets were shifting to digital, right? So I wanted, I wanted to launch something that was where the money was being spent. Of course, of course. So did that's how I decided to. Did you receive a lot of, oh, digital is not going nowhere. What are you doing? Like, no, I didn't, receive, I didn't receive that, but what I did receive it was uh, there's a lot of competition there's a lot of agencies how are you going to get business um who are you targeting because my my business targets uh, medium-sized companies right not the big corporations uh, for different reasons but that's what we target and and then uh, i got a lot of naysayers talking about yeah. how you know if if there's really an opportunity there or not and so you know, when you, what I've learned is that when you launch a business and probably you went through the same, you have to listen, you know, you have, yeah. it's, a, it's a risk, right? And you have to. Either they're to right, either they're right or they're wrong. <laughs> I mean, you have to figure out, I mean, you have to understand that people are giving you their best advice, but you have to choose what you want to take. And also you have to get together with people that help you figure out how. Of course. Right? Oh, I agree. I agree. It's so yeah. tough to like talk about this thing with people like that are not entrepreneurs. Like they, like it's. it's Listen, it's like it's like yeah. Th there's there's uh, um. I forgot who you know who 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 said this, but um. It's it's like criticizing people in a football game, right? You can be watching the football game and criticize all you want, but you have to be on the field to play the game, right? And you either win or you lose in, you know, playing the game, not being on the, on the bleachers, right? So I think that a lot of people are on the bleachers and they're criticizing or cheering you up, mm -hmm. right? But the game is going to be one playing it, of right? So you take a risk. You might, you might lose or you might win, but you have to play it, right? Um, so I take a lot of, advice you know i do take a lot of advice from people like you or people other entrepreneurs that are playing the game those people i listen a lot if somebody that is doing this is telling me listen that is a tough market to enter because i've tried it and this is what i found right or you know think of building your business model this way because i've gone through this and this is what i found i take that with a lot of respect yeah right? and pay a lot of attention because I'm learning over the, you know, they're telling me from playing the game. I agree. Right? I agree. 
I agree. No, I agree. That's, that's, yeah. It's, it's very important who you take advice from, right? Super yeah. important. Super important. Yeah. Gerardo, you worked at Disney. I love Disney. I've been going, like, it's one of my favorite brands. How was it? What were you doing there? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so so Disney, I worked for them when I was in London. So after leaving the Agio, um, I did a little bit of consulting and then moved to Disney. And with Disney, I was the marketing and digital director for Disney Channel, the TV, oh, wow. the TV channel for famous. Europe, Middle East, and Africa. For, and yeah, all. for for Europe, Middle East, and Africa. So I was in charge of that of, of that region, and it was a lot of fun. I did I did that for a while, and then I uh, then I worked a little bit for a little while doing business development for ESPN in Europe. Oh wow! Um, and then I got a job from Turner. That's when I moved to the U.S. But the, it was fascinating. I mean, Disney is a fascinating company because what I loved about Disney is the fact that they see themselves as a, a, a a property business. What does that mean? They have these franchises, they have these properties, right? Winnie the Pooh, Lion King, Toy Story, whatever. And that's intellectual property that they own. And then how do you exploit that intellectual property into, into a business? The sky's the limit, right? So you could do it through consumer goods, you know, lunch boxes and Boy. t-shirts and stuff like that, toys, movies. A, a, a books, video games, you know, whatever that is, TV shows, whatever, right? So w- what I found that it was very, very powerful was that thinking that the business is intellectual property, right? You know, you have the, you have the parks and you have business lines, right? So you have these business lines with the company, but all of those business lines are connected through intellectual property. And that's, that's an intangible, right? Because once you have an intellectual property once you've created an asset and that asset could be a mulan for example Mm -hmm. you can exploit that asset in many many different ways right Mm -hmm. so i i love that about them the one thing that i tell people is that what shocked me about disney was the fact that when you come in you you, you're coming in as a as a fan right so you think oh it's it's all gonna be chippendale and fun and love and it's not true i mean they're not at all. I mean, they're very profit oriented. They're very commercially savvy. They're very aggressive with their, with what they want to achieve. It's a business, right? It's a business. It's just, it's, it's a business that is in the business of just like, I'm proper gonna, things, right? I'm going to go so to you're the thinking, happiest place on earth. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the happiest place on earth. I'm you're not saying it in a bad money. way. No, it's a company. I'm not saying it in a bad way. I'm not yeah. saying that it's not, it's a good job environment. <laughs> But it's not, you're not in the park. That's yeah. what I'm trying to say. <laughs> that's, that's funny. That's funny. And was uh, Bob, Bob Iger, was he the CEO at that time? Bob Iger was the CEO at that time. Um, I, I was in between CEOs. Okay, so okay. when I was there, it was uh, the predecessor to Bob Iger. I forgot his name right now. And okay, then Bob, okay. Bob Iger took, uh, Bob, Bob Iger, yeah. you know, took, took the role. Yes. How did, like... I've never worked at this big company, but like making decisions, it's like, it takes weeks time. to make it. Like it takes, it, takes, time. it takes time. And do you think startups are going to eat their lunch or, or, or some of these big organizations or they're too big and too, too much money to fail? I, I, don't, I don't think um, a startup could take that type of business. I think startups can take many types of businesses. I'm not sure that type, because what, things, what happens with a business like Disney is that it's not, it's not one business. It's a connection of businesses that create value, right? So they have the streaming services and they have the parks and they have, everything is a line of business that is part of that property development, right? Super smart. So even if you, can, you had a startup that created a fantastic, it would just be one area. How do you how do you exploit it, right? I'm, you need the parks and the cruises and the you know you you need all of those. So I think that would be tough to yeah to, no. To do. But just to give you an idea, I mean they plan far in advance. So for example, I remember going into meetings. We used to call them we used to call them synergy meetings, where all all line of businesses would get together and share 
what they were cooking to see how everybody else could do something, right? So I remember being in a synergy meeting where the studio came to show us the storyboards for The Incredibles. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Great so move. it was a story, literally it was black and white storyboards of we're thinking of doing this movie. Uh, it's going to be about a family of uh, uh, superheroes. Uh, there's going to be the dad, the mom, this is going to be the characters we're thinking about. And every line of business is thinking, and, and the movie is going to be released in three years, right? And you have every line of business thinking, okay, if, if that's going to be the, what types of toys can we be creating for that type of movie? What type of uh, clothing could we be? So you start building all of that thinking way behind and by the time the movie hits the theaters, the whole plan is built and everybody's aligned and, you know, Walmart is full of toys and, and, and lunch boxes. You, you, you see what I'm saying? So okay. it's, it's incredible to see it in action. Okay, wow. it, it is quite a thing. Wow. It is quite a thing. Wow, yeah. no, that's amazing. And Gerardo, uh, Gerardo you, from Diageo to Disney, to, t to Turner, I mean, you, you stayed more time in Turner. Was there, or a, like, if you, if, was there a reason why you stayed more time in Turner? Like, was it the best, like, was it the, the place where you had more fun? I don't know if it's a place where I had more fun, but I had a very good career at Turner. I joined, uh, and I joined at a time where uh, the company was really growing in Latin America. I was, uh, I was brought to head uh, the marketing uh, department and the creative services department for one network. And in the years that I spent in Turner, I spent over, I think I spent around 14 years in Turner, 13 years in Turner. We acquired several competitors in the region. So we had to integrate wow. organizations. We grew from being an organization of 150 people to be an organization of over 2,000 people. Oh, wow. And, uh, and, and uh, we grew from having four networks to having 15 networks. And so, um, you know, it was a fantastic period to be there. There was, I, w I felt that I was, every year I was doing things differently. I was learning more. I was growing in responsibility. So it was just a fantastic time. That's why I stayed for so long. Normally you get bored of a job or you feel that you've hit the ceiling and you want to move somewhere else. But in the case of Turner, there was so much growth over that period that it, I just didn't, I just felt every year that it was a new job. No, I get so that's it. That's for so long. Yeah. And did you live around Latin America or was it all through Atlanta? So I was based out of Atlanta and I was traveling at least 50% of my time. I was going uh, six times, at least six times a year to Argentina, three or four times a year to Brazil, then obviously Colombia, Venezuela, Chile, Mexico, many times a year. Oh, wow. So what I ended up doing was uh, on the summers, I would move, right? So on the summers, I would just take my family and move for two months to Buenos Aires, two months to Sao Paulo, you know, because the kids were younger and it would be like a vacation for them and then I could work from, from that office, right? So I, I did that for a while. That's uh, amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. Gerardo and, man, that's pretty, pretty cool. When you were... That was pretty cool, yes. Yeah, and now that you were mentioned in travel, I love, I love asking this question. And I was talking to an executive the other day. He's like, man, when I used to work at this company... Everything, travel, tra uh, meeting, travel, trip, trip. Do you think business travel is going to end? Like, a, like, it's like, what do you think? Like, like I don't think it's going to end, but I think it's going to change. I mean, it's obvious. I mean, we were spending, I cannot tell you the budgets we manage for travel. You know, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year for the team to travel to different places. It's been demonstrated that you don't need to make the, that much travel. I mean, we would, people would travel for meetings. I would say, oh, there's an important meeting. I'm traveling to that meeting, right? Um, it's not needed. Honestly, it's not, uh, some meetings are certainly needed, for sure. Like an acquisition? I think, like, yeah. Yeah, or you have like a, like a sales conference, right? Or a very important strategy meeting where you need some key stakeholders to participate. But uh, I think businesses will uh, cut in travel. For sure. In the same way they will cut in offices. I don't think you need the office spaces that you... That you All you those buildings. Like what's going to happen to those buildings? Like full of expensive leases. Like who the hell, you know? I, I agree. I, I, don't, I, don't, I think 
work is going to change quite a bit. And it's interesting. My, my wife, she's a, a well-being coach, right? She, she works uh, wow. with an organization called, uh, called um, uh, Modern Health. And they, she, she coaches people on well-being, people from Dropbox, from Twitter, from Netflix. They have those clients, right? Um, and um, all of those companies are going to come back to a hybrid mode. You know, they, 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 they've realized that... Hybrid, Gerard, don't you think hybrid is like, you still have to live like in San Francisco, you know? Like you don't, maybe don't have to work in the office, but you, if it's hybrid, you have to work in... I don't know. Many of them are, are uh, given the chance to move cities and work remotely. And, and, and don't stay in San Francisco. You know, some are moving to Colorado, some are moving to North Carolina, to Austin, Texas. You know, a, lo a, lo a lot of these companies are moving. But I think what's going what's gonna to happen is going to be hybrid, like a WeWork type of space. Companies are going to realize that, this is my theory, right? Companies are going to realize that you don't need 100% office capacity for your workforce because some people are going to be working from home uh, some days a week, right, or permanently. So maybe they can they can reduce their office capacity to sixty percent or fifty percent, and have a model similar to a WeWork, which is yeah. you don't have an office, you come in and you pick up a hot desk, right? Yeah. So that way, when you're in the office, you have a space to work. You don't need your space, right? And they're going to be way I more modern. I love. That? I love. Yeah. Exactly. So I think I th if you ask me to tell you my prediction, I think that's probably what's going to happen. There, there, we're still going to have office work, but it's going to be more of that mode, I think. Okay, cool. Gerardo, now a question towards digital marketing. You see you work with a lot of brands and a lot of entrepreneurs. Where are, they, where are people failing when it comes to digital marketing that you see over and over again? Like... Like, wait, what can people do? I'm, this question is pretty generic, and I don't know if it's a good one. Uh, but in general, you, you, you work with a lot of brands and a lot of startups, companies. And like, where do you see people fail the most? That yeah, maybe, so, them, maybe they told you, yeah, we, 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 when they come to you, they've already wasted X amount of money or they've all, what mistakes do you see and what should people do before spending in digital marketing? I don't know if I just asked you like... No, 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 no. I, I think it's a good question, Daniel. I think when it comes... You know, what I've seen is that we're all marketeers in a way, right? Because we all think we understand. You know, I would never tell you how to uh, program a code. Right? Mm -hmm. I have no clue how to program a code. So when you, when I hire you or GMT, your company, to do some engineering, systems engineering for me, I, I wouldn't dare to tell you what to do. You're the expert, right? I tell you what I need. I know where you're going. I know where you're going. <laughs> but, but with marketing, we all think we're experts because we post and we, yeah. we, you know, we send emails. And so I have a lot of clients that come to me and say, listen, I think what I need is social media. I think what I need, I would like to do some email marketing. And my question, my first question is like, how do you know you, that's what you need? Oh, because everybody's doing it. Okay. And what are the results? You know, so uh, it's like putting the horse, you know, the cart ahead of the horse. So what, what I see a lot of people doing that I don't think, you know, that I don't think is conducive to success is they start with tactics because if you're Very thinking good. about, social media, search engine optimization, email marketing, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever. Those are tactics, right? That should respond to a strategy. So your strategy, you, you need mm -hmm. to think first about what is it that you need to achieve, right? Who's your audience? Who are you trying to target? How do you find them? What is their customer journey, right? So how do they get in touch with you? How, how do they find you? How do they, what, you know, what, what pain you need to solve for them so they buy from you, right? Um, once you have all of that understanding is, okay, now how, I, how, how do I get them to be attracted to my service, right? And mm -hmm. that's where you start thinking about 
how I'm going to convert them into a lead or into a, a, a or into a buyer. And after that, then you start thinking about what tactics do I use. So the tactics are the tools, right? So if I'm going for this audience that I know that has this type of customer journey, right? And this is what motivates them to take action. Then I'm going to use tactic A, B, and C in this way to implement that. So you have to build the strategy before you think of the tactics. So I, that's what I see that a lot of people they are just, doing wrong. They jump to tactics. Oh, we should do this because of that. Exactly. And exactly. they fail to do that first. You have to, it pays, it pays off to spend 10% 10, 10 of your budget in producing a plan so you don't waste 90% of your budget. A lot of people think, oh, that's going to be 10% of my budget. Yeah, but that's going to help you not fail 90%. the other 90%, yeah. right? It will yeah. maximize the 90%. <laughs> Give more money to Mark Zuckerberg and, 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 and Google. These companies are like printing machines. And do you think they're going to get, they're like, they print so much. I mean, they're so profitable. It's insane. They, Google, it's insane. YouTube, Facebook, like you talk to anybody and there's a Facebook, like you talk to any company, any startup, half of the budget goes to Facebook, half of it goes yeah. to Google. Like it's crazy. Do you think, what are the risks? I wanted to ask this question. Do you think Facebook, Google, these, these are the new, a uh, what well, what well, these are like the new top companies like where of course the, the 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 elephants in the room what what are their risks companies like like this ones? i mean they can be disrupted as they disrupted everybody else i mean before google you had yahoo right mm -hmm. um and the you know uh, see what's going on with Twitter, for example, right? You know, how, how Twitter lost uh, uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, its gravitas because Facebook grew up, right? And then Instagram came in and Facebook bought them, right? Because they saw the opportunity with the... But, you know, there's going to be the next thing uh, that, that, that will really <clears throat> uh, uh, put at risk these organizations, right? So these organizations are massive, <clears throat> but... Uh, I think the way they disrupted, they could be disrupted too. I don't know when that's going to happen or who's going to be able to do it, but it's possible for sure. I tell you one thing, <clears throat> the one thing that I find very interesting about Facebook and Google and all of those platforms <clears throat> is the fact that they created their own currency. What do I mean by this? Let's say if you're buying TV, right? If you're buying TV or if you're buying radio, if you're buying, you know, there's third party measurement systems that tell you the effectiveness of your buy, right? So you look at the gross rating points and Nielsen is measuring that, those or Ibope are measuring those and they report to the field how it, these, these companies are performing or these investments are performing. But when you look at if, if you bought a campaign in Google, who's reporting the performance of that campaign is Google through their AdWords, right? Or their Google Analytics. That's how you report, you know, they tell you what they're, what they're measuring. Same with Facebook. If you bought a campaign in Facebook, they are reporting to you Snapchat as well. the performance. So what I find incredible is that the market allowed this to happen. There's no way back, but they, but they created their own currency, right? Because they are taking your money and they're reporting back on the performance. You see what I'm saying? Oh, I get so, it. I get it. Crazy. So that's the new normal. You know, there's nothing we can do about it, but I find it incredible because it's, not, it's, it's unfair and you cannot compare apples with apples, right? So anyway, I don't know how that's going to get solved, but, um, but it's, it, it's something that as as somebody who's dealt with media budgets for a while, this is something that kind of like... Um, Ignore. It's, it's, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's different. It's different. It's different this time. Okay, yeah, yeah. Gerardo, I think, I, think I, don't, I think I don't have any more questions. Uh, I have some trivial questions, okay? Okay. Okay, so the first question is, what do you prefer? Snapchat or Clubhouse? Oh, um, 
I love Clubhouse. I'm sorry, I, but I'm 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 older. I love Clubhouse. I, it, I I like listening to people. I, I I find value from it. Are you bullish? Like you think it's gonna keep growing? No, no, I'm not. No, I'm not saying that. I'm actually I have stock stock at Snapchat, and I've done really well with it. But <laughs> but yeah. no, as a as a personal preference, uh, I prefer Clubhouse. I think Snapchat. You know, just just by looking at my teenagers, I mean they're Snapchatting all day. Right. So I, 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 yeah, I mean, they, they, I tell you what, TikTok, you know, uh, that's what, what, what do you prefer? Fa do, you, do you have fa fa Facebook stock? I don't, I don't have Facebook stock. No, it went up today. Okay. Uh, Facebook or Google? Uh, uh, what do I prefer as what? As a user as a, or as, as, a, a, as a stockholder? Google. Okay, okay, okay. Google. I just think everything that they do is, is so smart. And I have an issue with Facebook. I mean, I just, the way they use your data, I'm just very concerned about that. Uh, do you think it's really that bad? Like, because oh, yeah. this, is, this is something, I have a friend who works, I, I met a guy who works at Google. I'm not, he's not a friend. I met a guy who works at Google and he talks about Facebook at the most unethical company in the world. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't want to say that, and I don't want to no, say, you know, yeah, no, no. But, but, but I just think it's very risky. It's very, very risky, the amount of data that they collect. I just think there's a lot of risk in that. Yeah. Okay. What are I your... Mean, they, know every, they know everything about you, and they're listening to you. They're, you know, they, they're, they're, they're uh, um, probably this happened to you. Uh, it has happened to me uh, to be talking, let's say, to a friend. I was talking to a friend a year ago about a book by Franz Kafka, the, the German, the Czech uh, author, right? That's the most obscure, obscure thing you could, uh, you could be talking about. Who's gonna be, next day in Facebook, there's an ad about Metamorphosis, new, 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 new edition by Franz book. Kafka. I read the book, I read that book in high school. In high school, the, exactly. The, the... I, pro I promise you, the publisher did not buy uh, did not think there was an opportunity in advertising that. The only reason that was advertised is because they are listening to, you know, you know, to, to, to conversations and they are picking up on keywords and those ads, ads are being created dynamically for, 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 for advertiser that, you know, maybe there was a publisher buying advertising, but the ad was created dynamically based on keywords. So, so yes, I mean, I think to me that is very scary. No, no, I agree. I agree. I don't like the whole addiction thing. I yeah. struggle with the phone addiction, like yeah. the lack of focus up. Like it, I was, I don't know if you watched a Netflix documentary of these people, like you just leave your phone and you just feel like something's wrong with you. And I think yeah. these, I mean, the smartest people in the world go work there to keep you addicted. So like, yeah. I, that's the only issue that I kind of have. Yeah. But, but, but yeah. Okay. Thank you, Gerardo. Uh, and I would like to, I would like to invite you to our, uh, we have, we have a, uh, yeah, also we, a, a, I'm, I'm a, happy a, to attend <laughs> a video conversation. So I'll, I'll send you an invite. That'll, that'll be fantastic. Okay. Take care. Gracias. Daniel. Bye. Bye.